the key difference, I think one of the key differences in harking back to a point I made before with the social sciences is that we can set up fairly sophisticated controls and we can hone in on just one or two variables or even one variable and change that variable, keeping everything roughly constant or at least within bounds that we can control. The thing with the social sciences and particularly, you know, the reason you and I started to, to um, exchange emails and started to, to, to chat was um, related to this whole um, Phil Mason sexual dimorphism thing is how do you control for the, you know the, those how do you set up those controls in a sociological in a in a system whereby there are so many variables so many variables that can that can contribute um, and how do you how do you just sift out and say it's the, it's just this effect we can ignore all the environmental envir variables because we've just isolated this effect that to me seems like a remarkable claim it would be a remarkable claim in many areas of physics um, but in particularly in the social sciences, to say that we can screen out all these variables and just focus on one, just one variable, particularly in these complex sociological systems with lots of interplay in much the technical term, and I'm using the term chaos in its, its true technical sense. It's a non-linear, incredibly chaotic system, very sensitive to um, uh, small changes in initial conditions or any conditions along the way. That, to me, um, you know. It seems to be a uh, you know a real difficulty with the social sciences in terms of just how do you control parameters? Um, do you see what I'm getting? Yeah, at? yeah. Actually, I was going to jump in because I haven't really had a chance to talk about it in Please any do. video in particular. But as part of my doctoral thesis, because I was in interested for the social sciences, especially British political science, actually American political science as well, but disambiguating the more social norms of gender from the biological drivers. And in my second year, which is usually where you get lost when you're doing your PhD, I went down this sort of you know left turn where I wanted to investigate, and it was good to do, but all of the the possible biological drivers and the closest thing that was being done in political science was some work on tying a particular like possessing and was this was like back in the early 2000s so I'm, I'm kind of reaching back and in, um, into my memory here but it had to do with um, a fashion to try to link genetics to political preferences or people's political worldviews the problem with it was in terms of generalizing to a wider population was that in order to control for everything, they had to use twin studies. So when they wanted to look at the genetic, like possessing this gene and then how people ended up in terms of their political ideology, twin studies allowed them to look at fraternal twins, identical twins, twins that had been brought up together, twins that had been separated from birth. But even those twins were like from a study that was based in Minnesota that was, you know, collected with some Americans and probably disproportionately white and, you know, a lot of these other things. So, yeah, your, your, your point is exactly straight, you know, dead on that to make that move from a biological um, on off switch or causal mechanism whatever you want to try to test to a particular social outcome you know the closest we could get through experiment is twin studies but then those have limitations for generalization and then another possibility would be to go to everybody who's run for office and try to get them to give in a sample of you know for how much testosterone they have and then you know like look at that compared to how many people there are you know the the, the range in the um in the population but then you'd also have to control for like what birth order they were were they a first child because we know first children are more likely exactly. to preserve exactly. so by the time you build in all these other possible variables that you would need to control for the chance of that one little hormone ex having any explanation left by the time the model is run is just non-existent precisely enough I can couch it in the terms of a, of a mathematician or a physicist the problem with is not that there are so many of these variables is that they're not as we put it linearly independent they are all cross coupled you change this one and you change this over here uh, the twin studies thing is, is interesting there's a guy called Oliver James you might have heard of now he falls to put it mildly extremely heavily on the nurture versus the nature nature side um, I would argue that he overreaches occasionally, but his books are pretty good. I got um, a book that he'd written called "They Fuck Us Up," if you'll excuse the language. Yeah. Um, it's it's a line from it's from, it's a line from a Larkin poem about what yeah. your parents do. Yeah. So it's um, but uh, he makes the point. You know, when you talk about an environment, you have to be really careful to 
tease out what exactly you mean with environment because he argues right you know you could say that two kids brought up in the same house with the same parents in a reasonably stable environment going to the same school or all have you know have exactly the same environment but of course they don't particularly mm -hmm. for the first few years let's say one of those kids is three years older than the other for those first three years that first kid has had a completely different environment moreover the very fact that the kid was first born or second born will change to some degree how the parents interact with our child so you know in that sense you've got an incredibly complex environmental mix of parameters and then to break this down and say well no actually it's purely due to these biological differences and we can tease those out I have yet to see a you know I'd really like to hear from you on this I've yet to see a credible study which normalized out for environmental effects I, I you know time and again you'll always have a disclaimer in these papers which are attempting to look for, for gender differences um, well, there will be a disclaimer well, of course you know we've got to um, take it we've got to um, bear in mind that there will be you know socio um, economic or other types of societal um, contributions to this have you seen studies which have credibly normalized out environmental effects particularly when it comes to gender differences no <laughs> No. no, exactly. And, and I guess I should point out, I think we were chatting before we went live, Christy, and I said that I was admissions tutor, so I'm, I'm admissions yes, tutor for the physics, bring that up. Um, um, which means that uh, what that means in the UK parlance is that um, I oversee, along with a couple of colleagues, um, applications to the department. And what's very interesting is that the gender balance in physics um, both at A level, so at high school, is about 80 male to 20% female, and that continues um, into, into undergraduate um, physics. What's very interesting is that the balance in maths at A level is much more 50 50, and indeed at uh, university is much more 50 50. So that alone is, is very interesting. And, you know, the, the reason I wrote that blog post to which you referred right at the start is that I had this discussion on something called the Magic Sandwich Show, which I've agreed I'll be on. Um, I got another invitation, very kind invitation from DPR Jones, and I'll be on that next week discussing actually probably peer review as well. Um, but uh, it's because Phil Mason, um, I don't, I really have, don't have a huge amount of time for sort of juvenile handles like Thunderfoot, so let's call him by his real name, Dr. Phil Mason. Um, so Dr. Mason was making this claim that you could also tie gender differences in physics back to sexual dimorphism which as i said in the blog post is just how can you make that claim it's how can you dis deconvolve and i'll use the technical mathematical physical term how can you deconvolve out the environmental influences in any way that's credible and in fact i think it's it's pretty well an impossible problem because how can you ever credibly deconvolve out those influences i can't you know I've having read through a number of the papers, read through a reasonable amount of the of the literature, but certainly not as much as you have, and certainly not as much as your colleagues in social science have. To me, it just seems like an almost impossible, if not an impossible, task to out those influences when it comes to to looking at whether it's nature versus nurture, when it comes to aptitude um, and interest or even preference in terms of of STEM subjects versus other subjects. And I think a big problem that they have is, you know, you, it's fine to advance a theory, but first, you, you know, your theory is going to have to account for all the evidence. So how does a biological determinism or a sexual dimorphism theoretical framework account for change over time? Because we've seen rapid changes in a few decades. So how does your theory account yep, for that? Absolutely. Exactly. And then the, the thing you get back, and I, I noticed some of the comments under your video, and this guy, you've had the, the, the debates with in the past, I forget his name. Um, sorry, it's, it's late. And I'm, um, you mean the guy on the bit that I debated um, online? You, like Sargon, or is it someone in the comments? Yeah. No, no, no. Some, some, another guy, it was about the rape culture. Um, oh, no, it's the, the, the guy's name. Yeah, Thank Noel. you, Noel Plum. Um, and he makes the arm, to be fair, actually, his, some of his comments are uh, quite a little bit more... Um, I guess reasonable in terms of how they how we spend a reasonable amount of time clearly thinking them through. It appears, um, but he he makes the, the the point that you know, if, if, or he asks. Let me try and choose my words with care here. He 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 sets it up again as this very polarized thing, as saying, "Well, you're saying it's purely um, nurture. We're not. Well, certainly I'm not. I'm saying we do not know." And I cannot see how we could 
ever know that how much of it is due to any type of um, genetic component, a biological component, and how much of it is actually due to the societal component. If, if Noel or anybody else watching this knows how we credibly decouple those two things and, and work out, okay, this is 70% and this is 30% or vice versa, please tell me because I genuinely do not know. And as a physicist, as a physical scientist looking at this problem, to me, it just seems like a mass of interrelated variables that couple together. How you would ever model that credibly, you know, we have systems like the bloody simple pendulum. You take a pendulum that moves back and forth under a driving force. Um, that would behave, you'd think that would always behave nice and regularly. If you drive that hard enough, it'll behave chaotically. And chaotically, not in the sense of random, but chaotically in the sense of a nonlinear system being driven, etc. And that, you know, that's a bloody pendulum. That's a pendulum. It's an exceptionally, incredibly complicated system. With, oh, let me say, many variables. We'd have the driving force. We'd have the amplitude of the driving force, the frequency of the driving force. We'd have the natural resonance of the pendulum. Maybe four variables. Maybe four. And we struggle. Um, and it's only, you know, over the last 40 years with the development of nonlinear dynamics in case we finally got to understand that. To then extrapolate out to a system which has got hundreds of variables all coupled into each other and then to credibly claim that we can pull out this is the genetic component and this is the environmental component. Yeah, a friend of mine once said the world is one big endogenous mess. And I'm like, yeah, you got a point. Um, but uh, the other thing too is, yes, the, the sort of picking up the polar opposite. So because I say that there's no evidence for biological causal mechanisms for social outcomes, then the assumption becomes, you know, you're saying it's all nurture. Like, no, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is there's no evidence to support that position. And no matter how many times people try to make the argument, well, it just makes sense. Of course it would be the case. Look, um, look, male, male monkeys like to play with boy toys of course there's biological like no you have to come with evidence first where is your evidence Oh, it is remarkable. Yeah, it's just obvious that males and females are different. Therefore, their aptitudes are going to be. That, yeah. You know, how close, how unbelievably close to the argument is. Look at the complexity of an eye. This must have a designer. How could this ever have evolved? You how said it better. That yeah, are, you know, that's my point. I mean, you said it perfectly. You personally. said it perfectly. <laughs> personal incredulity and these are the people that argue with creation is saying that that's it and yet at the same time they're going oh, it's got to be look males and females are different therefore they're going to have to have differences when it comes to evidence show us evidence and the thing is the issue here is as i say is that i don't see how you can credibly normalize out the environmental component I, I honestly don't see how you can ever do that with and any type of credibility. The other thing that they will have to do, and I think this gets left out, is you have to not only account for variation between the sexes, if we just sort of homogenize it into a binary, but you also have to be able to account for variation within the sexes and whether or not there's crossover. So if you have women who, let's say, do have a high level of, te of testosterone, um, you know, then other women and men who are lower and then women that are higher are performing differently than the men who are at the lowest end of the spectrum, is it really then a sex difference? Because it seems to me like it's the hormone, not their biological sex. So this, you know, conflation of sex with like sex, you know, chemicals, or I don't know what else is supposed to mm. be driving these differences. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of explanation that those theories have to do that I don't think that they've really thought through all the way.